If you have a Bible, meet me in uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 is where we will be this morning. Uh, this is a story, and we talk a lot about the things that happen in the Bible as stories, but I don't want you to think of them as fairy tales or stories that are told to little children to make them feel good. No, no, no. These are real life events. These things actually happened, and, and I believe that, and here at Rooted Fellowship, we believe that, that these things actually happened, and so there's a number of things happening in Luke chapter 24, but where I want to focus our attention is, uh, is these two individuals, these two disciples, as Luke uh, tells us, they are on their way to this place called Emmaus. Now, now, it's a very interesting story because it's right at the end of Luke's account of, of Jesus and his life. It's, it's right at the end of the gospel according to Luke. And it's a little bit weird for me. I've always found it quite strange because it's like Luke tells this entire story of Jesus and all that he did and uh, it's absolutely incredible. And then he's about to land the plane and then he introduces two new characters. It's like watching a movie and you're really, really enjoying it and you're, you're just like, man, I get what's going on and I get the plot and it makes sense and you can feel that they're about to land the plane. You can feel like this movie is about to come to an end and then all of a sudden you get these new characters and you're like, no, hold on, what's this about? And they are important characters. They're not just randoms. They're not extras in, in this movie. They are important characters because they play an important role. That's what's happening here in Luke chapter 24. Th these two individuals aren't as random as maybe some of us may think. That, that what they are doing in this particular moment as Jesus has this encounter with these two disciples is, is in a way, it's summarizing all of Luke. It's summarizing everything that Jesus came to do. And I find it incredibly fascinating. And so as we wrap up Awaken Weekend, I, I felt that this might be a really good passage for us to walk through. As we look to baptisms, this might be a really helpful passage to not only set our hearts to, to posture it in a way that we see God for who he is and what he has done for us through his son Jesus, but that the implications would have a rippling effect in our lives. You guys ready? Luke chapter 24, from verse 13. Hear these words of our Father. It says, now that same day, now this is the, the, the day of Jesus' resurrection. A lot's been going on, right? So now this is the day of Jesus' resurrection. Now that same day, two of them, this is two of Jesus' disciples, but, but not any of the 12, most probably they, they were part of the 72. Jesus had sent out 72 disciples in uh, Luke chapter 10. We read about it there. And so they, they, these were the guys who were maybe on the fringes. They were kind of following and, and hearing, but they weren't necessarily part of the 12. They were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place place. It had been a busy week in Jerusalem. And while they were discussing and arguing, that's important for us to know. This isn't just a mere conversation. No, no, no. They were discussing and arguing. The, these men were confused. They were frustrated and they were probably in tears. Emotions were everywhere. These men were filled with grief and sorrow, anxiety on high levels. Fear was creeping in. They were trying to make sense of everything that had just happened. We've been following Jesus for years. Yes, we weren't necessarily part of the 12, but we were on the fringes and we were, we were hearing and we were seeing. And things were looking good. There was a movement that was beginning to grow around Jesus. And then he gets captured, he gets beaten, he gets hung on a cross, he dies, he gets put in a tomb. What on earth is going on? This isn't the liberation that we were thinking about. And so they're arguing. 
They're discussing. They're going back and forth. What do you think that meant when he said this? Why did this happen? What, what is going on? Luke also tells us that they are on their way to Emmaus. Now, there's nothing wrong with Emmaus, but what it represents points us to something that's going on here. Watch this. See, in their time of chaos, instead of going to God for clarity, for for understanding, for, for comfort, instead of going to God, we find them walking away and down. Now you might go, what, what's that got to do with anything? You see, J- J- Jerusalem was on a mountain. It was next to Mount Zion, all right? So it was up on a mountain, about 785 meters above sea level. So it's quite high. And so if you wanted to get to Jerusalem, if you wanted to get to the temple, if you wanted to get to what the Bible calls the holy place, then you had to look up and go up. But we find them going away and going down. John chapter 5, verse 1, it tells us that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134, those psalms are, are known as the Psalms of Ascent. History tells us that that the the people making their way to Jerusalem to go and worship, they would sing those psalms step by step as they looked up and went up. But here, in a time of chaos, in a time of confusion, we find these two going away and going down. And when we go away and we go down from where God is, that is not a good thing. We know this in Luke, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan and and he says a certain man was going down away from Jerusalem. If you're familiar with that story, you know it doesn't end well for that man. Let me tell you guys, good things don't happen when we walk away from God. While they are in this state, Luke then tells us, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. We're told that Jesus shows up, but but they don't know that it's Jesus. To them, it's just another traveler. And in the Jewish culture, much like Southern Hemisphere culture, it, it wouldn't have been weird for them to walk together, even if they hadn't met before. A simple head shake, a maybe a grunt of hello. That was enough to acknowledge presence and then we continue walking down the same direction. Verse 16, the, but they were prevented from recognizing him. Now, we, we don't know. Was it their own grief and sorrow that kept them from seeing Jesus, maybe? Was it a lack of faith, maybe? Did they think to themselves, this guy looks kind of familiar, but there's no way. Remember, they were arguing and discussing. They was like, but we saw him die. There's rumors that the, the, the tomb is empty. I, I, probably not. Did God prevent them from seeing that this was Jesus because of what was going on in their hearts? Remember, they are walking away and down. There's a lot that we miss when we walk away and down. All of these are possibilities. But what we can say is that these men were clearly spiritually walking and talking blind. That's what was happening. Verse 17, then he, this is Jesus, asked them, what is this dispute that you are having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. Can you imagine that for a moment? Like I said, it's been a busy week in Jerusalem. I mean, if, if it was in our time, it'd be hashtag death, hashtag where is Jesus, hashtag oh my goodness. That's what would be trending. And so Jesus shows up, they don't recognize him, and he's like, so uh, what are you guys talking about? I mean, I can imagine the look, it's like, who is this guy? Verse 18, the one named Cleopas answered him, 
are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? It's been a busy week. I find it funny that it's at that point that we get one of the names. I kind of feel bad for Cleopas a little bit. I mean, he, he's going to be known for all eternity as the person who asked Jesus whether he knew about the crucifixion. Do you know what I mean? It's like, we're going to get to heaven and we'll be like, you know that guy? It's you. Well, do you not know? Like, you know what I mean? It's like... I love it. If you ever wondered if Jesus had a sense of humor, here it is. Because look at his response to that question. <laughs> Verse 19. What things? <laughs> he asked them. What? Like, how, I, I love it. I, abs- I wish I was a fly on the wall watching this. It's like, do, it's like, do, you, do you not know? He's like, what? what happened? You guys seem a little stressed. What's going on? They said to him, and what we see in verses 19 to 24 is, is they begin to unpack, hear this, truthful facts about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. They're unpacking truthful facts about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Truthful fact after truthful fact after truthful fact. They knew his name and where he was from. They knew he was a prophet. They knew he was mighty in deed and word. They knew he was crucified. They knew he promised to redeem Israel. They knew others had said that he had rose from the dead. Truthful facts. And yet they still missed Jesus. These men knew facts about the gospel, but they didn't recognize the face of the gospel. They knew so much, yet understood so little. And friends, hear me, I believe that this is the problem that we face here in South Africa. Dare I say, even here at Rooted Fellowship, that we have people who know so much about the Bible. We know the verses. We know the songs. We've been to the Bible studies. And yet, we don't recognize Jesus. See, there is a difference between knowing and believing. There is a massive difference between knowing and and believing, and, and, and so many of us, we fall into this trap because, because we have so much head knowledge. We can quote the things. And so when we hear the gospel message and then we, we, we're called to respond to it, we go, he must be talking about my neighbor. Ooh, this is a great message for my colleague. I wish they were here. Ooh, if, you know, if, if only, only my boyfriend could hear this gospel message and repent. No, 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 it's for you. There is a difference between knowing and believing. And so, even though they give these truthful facts, Jesus rebukes them. I hope you see it. Jesus rebukes them in verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. A a fool in the Bible is usually a person who does not allow the scriptures to influence his or her thinking or behavior. And these disciples are bullseye fools. He rebukes them. Like, can you imagine that? Like, you show up and you're like, well, let me tell you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Fool! It's because Jesus can recognize that it's just here, you actually don't believe. We're also told that they were slow to believe. That's a heart issue. Slow to believe what they did know. So, yes, something was happening up here, but it was not making it down here. They weren't believing all the prophets, all that the prophets had spoken about. They they had overlooked the prophecies about the Messiah having to suffer. See, they were preferring instead to focus on only those that predicted of his glorification. 
We, we just want to skip the suffering part and just get to the glorification. But you can't do that. You can't get the crown without walking through the cross. And yet so many of us want to do that. And when we live this way, here's what's happening. That is an incomplete gospel. You've got all the facts. But but you're missing, you're missing, you're missing some essentials. If these two disciples had understood and believed what the Old Testament revealed, they would not have felt depressed, but rather would have been full of joy. I want you to think about that for a moment. They would not have been depressed, but, but they would have been filled with joy because they would have gone, you know what, it's happening. Everything that the prophets had said, it is now happening. Everything that Jesus had said, it is now happening. This is good news. It is not a time to cry, but it's a time to praise. But because this was not the case, Jesus says, okay, because you guys have missed it. You've missed everything that you have read about what the prophets have said. Because you've missed it, let's do this. Let's, let's just go back to the word. Let, let's, let's go back to what the scriptures say. Not, not your feelings. I say this all the time. And I will continue, as long as I have breath in my lungs, I will continue to say it. Guys, your, your feelings matter, okay? They're important, okay? I want you to know that. They're good and they, 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 they do all the things. It's great. But your feelings cannot be your savior. And so even in moments of chaos and uncertainty, you, you recognize those feelings, but then you, you go back to the word. What does the word say? What does God say? And so that's what Jesus does. He goes, I can see you guys are in a state of panic. You've completely missed everything that I have said. So let's just go back to the word. He says in in verse 26, wasn't it necessary, say necessary, Necessary. wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, I cannot get my head around this. Like like everything before, I'm like, oh yeah, I definitely don't want to be these disciples. Lord, do not use me as an, ex- as an example for a- all eternity. Don't, don't, foolish. No, no, no. But this part, yes, please. To, to sit with Jesus, to have a Bible study with Jesus, where he goes, okay, hold on. Let's open up the scriptures. Let's talk a little bit here. He begins to have a Bible study with these two disciples. As he walks them through the Old Testament, he shows them how each book is about him, is pointing to him, is revealing him. And it's doing so, so that we might see that he is our only salvation. T- Tim Keller would, would say this a lot. He says, when you teach or when you preach or whenever you are sharing the, the scriptures, you need to make sure that you lift up Christ in every text. Now, there's a lot of people who are like, mm, but, uh, Christ is not, a, you're missing the point. Like, I get it. There may be one line where it's like, okay, I don't really see how, but what, what he's saying is that as you read the scriptures, you must always remember that they are pointing to Jesus, that they are revealing Jesus. And so in this case, Christ is teaching himself from the text. How amazing is that? This is what I like to call biblical theology because I, I believe biblical theology reveals that. It kind of walks through the scriptures and it goes, listen, I want to show you how this and this and this is all connected to Christ. And let me show you how this and that and this is all connected to Christ. I mean, Mojo did an absolutely incredible job last night where he went, remember what Peter spoke about? It's connected to what Moses was talking about. And all of it is connected to Jesus. That's what he's doing with them. That Christ is everywhere. In the scriptures. He is everywhere in the Old Testament. 
Let, let, let me show you that in Genesis, he is the, the seed of the woman that came on a rescue mission to crush the head of the serpent. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb that liberates his people. In Leviticus, he's the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. In Numbers, he's the cloud by day and the fire by night to lead the way. In Deuteronomy, he's the greater Moses. In Joshua, a commander of our salvation. In Judges, the true judge. In Ruth, the king's man's redeemer. In Samuel, the prophet. In Kings, the only true king of kings. In Chronicles, the glorious temple. In Ezra, the faithful scribe and rebuilder of all that is broken. In Nehemiah, the one who reestablishes the covenant. In Esther, he is our advocate. Shout out to Mordecai. What a man. In Job, Jesus is the one who moves from suffering to blessings while maintaining faithfulness to God. In the Psalms, he is the good shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, the lover of our souls. In Isaiah, the suffering servant. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, the weeping savior. In Ezekiel, the son of man. In Daniel, the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. In Hosea, the faithful bridegroom when we are the unfaithful bride. In Joel, the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. In Amos, the unexpected prophet who makes bold declarations about the sin of Israel. In Obadiah, the judge who opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In Jonah, the forgiving Messiah. In Micah, the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, the promise of good news and peace. In Habakkuk, the one who not only cries out for revival, but brings it. In Zephaniah, the restorer of the remnant. In Haggai, the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, the pierced son. In Malachi, the son of righteousness. Jesus screams the scriptures and the scriptures scream Jesus. But do you believe? Do you believe? The disciples were so blown away that that they invited Jesus. Still didn't know it was him. They invited Jesus to come over and stay with them. Many would say that this was because of Jewish hospitality. Sure, that's true, right? They have a culture of hospitality, but I also believe that this is primarily because the conversation was so good. Verse 28, they came near the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged, hear that, urged. So something is beginning to happen in their lives. As they see Jesus kind of go, like from Genesis all the way to, to Malachi, they're just going, something's happening here. Listen, listen. He's kind of making, they probably grab you. Listen, listen. Why don't you come stay with us for a little bit? Stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. J.C. Ryle says this. He says, Christ does not always force his gifts upon us, unsought and unsolicited. He loves to draw our desires and to compel us to exercise our spiritual affections by waiting for our prayers. I love that. That he is working in our lives, softening our hearts, Getting us to that point where you kind of go, you know what, I'm realizing that I've been made for more. That these things that I'm running to will not satisfy. That's how he draws us in. I believe that that's what's happening here. Little by little, he's drawing them in. Verse 30, it was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Jesus here moves very quickly from being a guest to now being the host. He now hosts this meal that would change these disciples' lives forever. Now look, I, I get the language that we use in the church where we talk about we're inviting Jesus into our hearts. Totally get it. I'm not against it. My, my only issue with it is that it, 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 it creates kind of this, this, this false Jesus of what he does when he's now in your life. Rest assured, friends, you, you don't invite Jesus to be the guest in your life. Jesus doesn't have a category like that. 
oh, in your life, I'm just a guest here. That's not how it works. We, we surrender. So when people say invite, what we're actually saying is surrender your life to Jesus. Give it all to him. Yes, I understand. He is knocking at the door of your heart. I get that. And so it's like, well, then that means I got to open. T- totally get it. Let's keep going with it. But when you see Jesus, it is now surrender. T- take it all. Every ambition, every goal, every relationship, how I think about my sexuality, everything. Just, just take it all. See, wherever Jesus is, he is Lord. He's not, he's not in your life and now working up like a video game, like I'm trying to get to that level. He's working up to become Lord in your life. No, 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 no. Wherever Jesus is, because of who he is, he is Lord. And so, if he is not Lord in your life, hear me, then he is not in your life. Let me make it plain. It means that you're not a Christian. Ah, but pastor, you can't say that. It's baptism Sunday. If, if, If Jesus is not Lord of your life, then he is not Lord at all in your life. He he is not present in your life. He's he is not there. And so he steps in, these guys thinking, oh, we have a guest. He goes, no, 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 I'll take over from here. Put everything down. Put the cutlery down. I will take over from here. That's what happens when you surrender your life to Jesus. I'd like to talk to you about my relationships. Calm down. Put that down. My ambitions. I have these goals. I've got this, this thing that I've put on the... That's okay. Put, put those markers down. He becomes the host. Verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. Now there's a number of reasons to how this could have happened and why this could have happened. Here's my take on it. Yes, it is. You know, they they weren't at the Last Supper. So you can't say like they were like, you know, we remembered when he did this. No, no, no. But it could have been. We don't put God in a box. He can do whatever he wants. But I think it's as he lifted up his hands and they saw the holes, they went, that's him. That's him. And then it tells us that their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. Man, I love it when Jesus does these things. (laughs) What we're seeing here is the voice of God. Not, not audible that you hear with your ears. I mean, we, we hear with our ears all the time and still many don't believe. So something deep is happening here. They're listening with their hearts. The heart, hear me, the heart must be captivated. Then the heart must surrender. It, it's one thing to just be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the feels, but then to not surrender, well then you're gonna feel the feels until Wednesday and then life's gonna hit you in the face. And then you're going to find yourself walking away and down. You're going to find yourself reading all of this and going, but I'm, I, I, I'm reading this and I know this and I know this, but why is it not coming alive? They said to each other, hear this. I don't title messages. Everyone this weekend had a title. I've got a title for my message. I was like, you're making me look bad. I don't have titles. But if I did have one, here it is. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? Were were our hearts not on fire? Did our hearts not burn? Not a flicker, not a nudge, not a tinkle, no, no, burn. When last did your heart burn as you fellowshiped with Christ, because that's what's happening. They're fellowshipping with Christ. They're they're in the word. They're they're, they're with the word. He is the word. When last did your heart burn? I'm telling you, so many of us, we get so comfortable in this. 
failing to recognize, and I, and I say this, I say this with both love and I say it also with conviction and urgency, that many of us, it's, it's the captivated, but it's not the surrender. And because we live in a country like this, where it, th- this is so accessible, you could, you could leave here, you could be like, oh, I don't like Rooted, whatever, and go down the road and there'll be another church there. And still, hear me, we still don't have enough churches. Okay, so let's plant some churches. But, but we live in a context where you could just go, you know what, I can get into the rhythm of this and it becomes so routine and regular and common that what's actually happening is just, it's the captivated but no surrender. And then life hits you and you're like, oh my goodness, what's going on? And, and I'm in desperate, oh, back again. Captivated, no surrender. And then you think, you think when Pastor Jonas hits that guitar, you're like, my heart is on fire. No, it's not. It's just he's really good at it. But your heart has, when lost, when lost did your heart burn for him? Weren't our hearts burning with us, within us? Like, like it's, this, it's this consuming fire. It's just like, I, I can't get, oh, because I'm, I'm in the scriptures. I'm fellowshipping with him. I'm breaking bread with Christ. I'm, I'm blown away by all of this and all that he has done for me, that every day is an ongoing burning. I mean, even when they were, unaware of his true identity and skeptical of his resurrection, their hearts were still ignited by the powerful message of God's word and the presence of Jesus, the embodiment of divine truth. This is why we preach the Bible. We don't come up with good ideas and cool hashtags and really amazing slogans. No, we preach the scriptures. It's more than a tingle. It's more than a slight itch. It's a consuming fire that takes over and all you want to do is keep it going. You know, like when you're sitting in front of a nice warm fire and it, it slowly goes out, what do you do? You, you get up and you get some wood and you put it back on there. Why? Because you want the fire to keep going. If your physical warmth is that important to you, why not your soul? The transformation that occurs here in Luke Chapter 24 is not a a mere intellectual or moral change. No, dear friends. It's a deep reorientation of our minds, our hearts, and our purpose. I believe this is why Luke gives us this this short account of these two disciples with Jesus. Because he's going, listen, like, I I know you guys like to read fast. Because you want to sing the last song and go home. Okay, let me insert this here and go... I'm going to summarize what happens when you encounter Jesus. It is a complete reorientation of our minds, of our hearts, and our purpose. I'll be brief. Jesus transforms the disciples' minds. See, before their encounter with him, they are are filled with confusion and misunderstanding. But Jesus transformed their minds by explaining that his death should not have come as a surprise because it is in fact a key part of the Bible and necessary, say necessary. Necessary Necessary for our salvation. It's part of the plan. And and, and if, if, if you had a mind that was constantly being renewed and you read the scriptures, you would go, this is part of the plan. What's happening in life at the moment, it's all part of the plan. Remember, he said he's coming back. And so from the time he ascended and from the time he comes back, church, we've got work to do. It's part of the plan. When when culture goes, no, no to the church. And you go, oh my God, what's happening? If you you were here, if you were being transformed, you'd go, it's part of the plan. It's part of the plan. And I get it, it's horrible. It's, It's not great when society pushes back against the church, but it's part of the plan. What, you think the kingdom of darkness is going, oh, sorry, didn't realize it was you, Richard Fellowship. No problem. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Jesus transformed their minds by opening their eyes to recognize him personally as they ate together. The work of transformation, it, it, it begins in our minds. The mind matters. It really does matter. G- G- Satan, Satan is on a, a mis information campaign. Good friend of mine likes to say that. I love it. 
And we see it with his encounter with Jesus when he's, he's tempting him. He, he goes, but are you really? If, if you are, if you really are the son of God, I'm trying to get into your mind. Is that, is that, does that promise really say? Is that, I mean, think about it. Is that promise for you? Let's, the mind matters. And so Jesus transforms their minds. But it doesn't end there. Jesus transformed the disciples' hearts. B- before their encounter with Jesus, they were filled with despair, grief, and sorrow. Their hearts were heavy. They had hoped that Jesus was going to be the one to redeem Israel, but then his own people rejected and killed him. They, they wanted to believe that the, that the rumors of his resurrection were true, but, but they didn't want their hopes crushed yet again. Heavy hearts. But Jesus transformed their hearts by convincing their minds of the good news, which caused them to burn with joyful significance of his sacrificial death and triumphant resurrection, defeating sin, death, and Satan with one decisive blow. The work of transformation flows from our minds to our hearts. And so many of us, we stop here. You can know, okay, there are people Okay, now you need to think, don't think about who they are. They are. You know there are people who know so much of God's word, but are the most hateful, angry, controlling people you've ever met. Zero forgiveness. Okay, that's on the one end here. There's people who know, but are so discontent, dissatisfied, like nothing, it's just like, and yet they know so much. They know about the joy of the Lord. And yet it just, it just doesn't make its way here. And so to not be exposed, they spend so much time going, let me tell you what I know up here. Did you know? Did you know? Da, 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 da. They, they are masking something that's happening here. Jesus transforms hearts. Jesus not only stops there, Band, you guys can come up. Jesus not only stops there, Jesus transformed the disciples' purpose. R- remember, before meeting Jesus on the road, they were going away and down. They were leaving Jerusalem with heads hung low. Three days had passed since Jesus' death, and, and, and so they were going, well, I guess it's time to return to life as normal. But Jesus transformed their purpose by giving them a new mandate to life. See, with Jesus, there's no such thing as normal. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus, I'm telling you what you need to do is put normal aside. Remember, he is now the host of the table and he goes, okay, all those plans that you had, really, really cool. You're so creative. (laughs) But now I'm gonna put you on the greatest adventure of your life. And I'm telling you, it's nothing that you ever imagined. That prayer almost wrecked me. Confidence, your prayer, like, because what happens in that moment is that, because we are forgetful. And so what happens in that moment is like, you're, you're recalling and you're going, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Because he transforms our purpose. Verse 33, that very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. That very hour. When Jesus does a thing in you, it's not a, I need to go back and formulate a plan and figure out if this is going to happen and how am I going to do it and is it in the budget? And it's, No, 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 no. That very moment, they found the 11 and, and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Th- then they began to describe what had happened on the road. When you have an encounter with Jesus, all you have is Testimony. Testimony after testimony after testimony. And, and, and praise Jesus for the testimony that we, we may hear, I don't know, but, but, but the testimony of how Jesus saved you. I love those testimonies. But what did he do yesterday for you? Why, why don't you have a testimony of yesterday? Has he stopped working? They began to describe what happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. You see, the disciples of Jesus were then entrusted with the task of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't know why he does it. I really don't. I really don't. 
But while on this rescue mission, he invites us to be a part of it. Frail, unfaithful, weak. And yet he still goes, no, 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 come. Come, let's go. Let's go and let's make disciples who will go on to make more disciples, who will go on to make more disciples. We are a product of those who faithfully went, whose lives were radically changed by Jesus. And they just said, you know what? We just want to spread the good news of Jesus everywhere. That's why we sit here. You heard it in the prayer. This is not our own invention. We did not come up with this. And then we just get to be a part of what God is continuing to do. And there'll be generations long after us who will never know our names, but they will know the name that changes lives, the name that saves, and that name is Jesus. And that's what happens with these two disciples. They just go, you know what? Whatever we were planning to do, stop, turn around, let's go back, and let's go spread this good news. And so the question today is, will you surrender your life to Jesus? Maybe you're on your way down and away. You're trying to make sense of your own life. You're trying to figure it out. You've got your own plans. You think you're the master of your own destiny. You want to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's not going to work. Only Jesus can. And hear this. He loves to save people. It's not this thing that he has to do. Many of you, you get up. Tomorrow, you're going to get up and go to work and you're like, I have to do this because I hate it. Jesus goes, I love to do this. I love to save people. I, I love to awaken people to the wonder of my Father and, he's, and what He has done through me by the power of the Spirit. It's, it's a joy. All we have to do is surrender. The most courageous thing you will ever do is confess. They don't teach you that at school. You don't find that in books, but the most courageous thing you can do today in this very moment is to confess, is to say, I I don't have the answers. I'm not in control. I cannot save myself. And so I confess, but I confess to the one who can. Surrender and watch him transform your mind. I know you might be going, oh, but, but does this, does this, does this, does this. He can't wait to be with you and to open up the scriptures and to go, yeah, that thing you're wrestling with is about me. And that thing you're wrestling with, it points to me. And that thing, you, it reveals me. And it reveals this plan that God put in place to come and rescue you. So he'll transform your mind. And then watch him set your heart on fire. Did our hearts not burn? And then as you walk out those doors, you watch your purpose change. The reason I call it the greatest adventure of your life is because I believe that that's what it is. Anything else that you're doing pales in comparison, pales in comparison to being on the rescue team that Jesus is leading. And so will you surrender? I'm gonna pray, we're gonna sing. And those folks who are getting baptized, would they come and get ready? But if you're sitting here, I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna go ahead and just pray. And so Father God, would you do a work that only you can do right now in this very moment? Would you reveal to every single person in here, myself included, that we are in desperate need of a savior and his name is Jesus. And and God, I I ask that you would push back all those things that, that keep people from taking that step towards you. That so often it's like, no, this this thing has got to come in this particular way and and, and in that particular way. But, But God, I'm praying that you would reach in and grab a hold of hearts. Holy Spirit, would you transform minds? That we could say thing after thing after thing after thing, but Holy Spirit, it's you who opens up, who unlocks who reveals. And so would you do that this morning? And so if you are here and you're going, I want to take that step towards Jesus. 
It is so simple. All you have to do is say, God, I surrender. I, I, I surrender. There's no like these ABCs and one and two and three. No, it's simply going, I surrender. It's crying out to him and saying, I am in desperate need of a savior. Would you save me? And hear this, Jesus loves to do it and he will do it. And so that is our prayer. Save us, Jesus. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.